Hey, it's Joe, and this is the fifth installment in the Quant Trading and Futures video series. Today we'll be discussing overfitting. We're going to begin with a statistical definition of overfitting. So here's one from the Oxford English Dictionary. It says that overfitting is the production of an analysis that corresponds too closely or exactly to a particular set of data and may therefore fail to fit additional data or predict future observations reliably. So here you've got a cluster of 10 points. There's two fits we have to these points. You have the simple linear regression and you have a 10 degree polynomial. The 10 degree polynomial fits them perfectly in that the graph passes through every single point. But if you were to use either of these models to predict where the next point is going to land, pretty much everyone will agree that you'll want to use the linear regression, even though it's a simpler model. So overfitting is when you use the more complicated model because it looks very good on the training data, but it doesn't work on the testing data. So now let's extend that definition to look at overfitting in quant trading. Overfitting in quant trading is identifying a false pattern in a data set through the repeated analysis of counterfactuals, most commonly through the tweaking of parameters, introducing hindsight bias. So think back to the moving average cross example we looked at way back in video two, intro to quant trading. Strategy has two parameters, N1 and N2. Let's say we've run the strategy for five different parameter sets and computed the Sharpe ratio. These numbers are made up, by the way. But so you have a Sharpe ratio for each parameter set. And note that for the parameter set N1 equals 30, N2 equals 100, the Sharpe ratio is amazing, 3.7. But if you vary those parameters just a little bit, either down to 2075 or up to 4125, the strategy loses money. So this would be a very clear example of an overfit strategy. You can't just say, ah, I've discovered the magic combo, if you use 30 and 100, the strategy will make so much money because it's overfit. You should have stable parameters. There should be smoothness here. Instead, it's very jagged. If you change the parameters just a little bit, the sharp ratios change dramatically. It's totally oversensitive. Overfitting is far and away the most common backtesting mistake. Dmitris Melas, head of research at MSCI, said, I've never seen a bad backtest. And a lot of times when you're overfitting in quant trading, what you're really doing is p-hacking. P-hacking is when you perform many statistical tests on data, but you only pay attention to those that have significant results. Statistical tests and significance levels are only valid if you're doing one test. So in statistics, the alpha equals 0.05 significance level is commonly used. So what does that mean? That means we will view results as significant if the probability of those results occurring by random chance is less than 5%. And that's all fine and well if you're only doing one experiment. But if you go out and you do 100 experiments, it's almost a statistical certainty that some of them will end up with p-values less than 0.05. But if you believe that, that means the experiment that does have a p-value less than 5% is actually significant, you're really just deceiving yourself. And an analogous problem is rampant in quant trading. So if you test many different parameter sets for high Sharpe ratios, there's going to be some that do have high Sharpe ratios. It's a statistical certainty. But the same thing, if you convince yourself that the handful of parameter sets with high Sharpe ratios is evidence that the strategy works, you're just deceiving yourself. If a backtest is done incorrectly, it will make a strategy look amazing on historical data, but it will lose money when it's live traded. It's important to remember that quant trading is not about modeling the past. It's all about predicting the future. Overfitting is even rampant in academia because of publication bias. So in the paper Replicating Anomalies, who at all retested 447 anomalies identified in academic papers, and they found that only 15% were significant at the t stat equals 3 level. Why t stat equals 3 instead of the more commonly used t stat equal 2? It's because it's inevitable that there will be some fitting. There will be multiple tests run. Many different parameter sets will be evaluated. And so you need a stricter significance level in order to ensure that the results are actually significant. But that's beside the point. They explain more in the paper. The big takeaway is that only 15% of these studies were actually significant. Why is that? That's because of publication bias. Publication bias is when the outcome of a study influences 
the decision of whether or not to publish the study. So Harvey et al. In and the cross-section of expected returns explained that the assumption that researchers follow the rules of classical statistics, e.g. randomization, unbiased reporting, is at odds with the notion of individual incentives, ironically one of the fundamental premises in economics. So imagine you're a researcher, your job is to find anomalies, but finding true anomalies in the financial markets is very difficult. We have to publish something because you have to keep your job. Right? So this is the big problem with finding trading strategy ideas in academia by combing through academic papers. You still have to look because, hey, 15% were significant, that's non-zero, but you have to swim through a lot of garbage to get there. And for non-academics posting on the internet, it's likely even worse. All right, so that's enough about how bad overfitting is and how common it is in finance. Now we're gonna discuss how to avoid overfitting. So we're gonna go through three different methods parameter diversification, measuring parameter stability, and out-of-sample testing using a rolling window. All right, so parameter diversification. Using just one parameter set leaves you vulnerable to the idiosyncratic risk associated with that particular parameter set. What if that parameter set is overfit? So you want to diversify and trade many different parameter sets. It's the same philosophy as when you want to hold many different stocks in a stock portfolio for diversification, you want to spread your wealth between many different asset classes, some in stocks, some in bonds, some in commodities. Same exact concept here. You're minimizing your exposure to one particular parameter set, just applying diversification to parameter sets. You're going to assign weights to these parameter sets based on their performance over the training sample. I'll explain in a minute what exactly I mean by the training sample. And the idea is to create a diversified portfolio of parameter sets, minimizing the idiosyncratic risk associated with each one. This is the goal. It's also important to check for parameter stability. So how do you do that? For each parameter value, you're going to group all the parameter sets that have that particular parameter value, and you're going to take the mean of the performance metrics to get the cross-sectional performance metrics for that parameter value. So there's a lot going on there. Let's break it down. So Think about earlier when we looked at the moving average cross example that was very clearly overfit. We knew it was overfit because if the parameter values changed just slightly, the Sharpe ratios would change dramatically. And in that case, it was very clear because it was a very simple strategy. The strategy only had two parameters. So you could just look at the Sharpe ratios for each parameter set and make that deduction. But what if you have a strategy that's more complicated, a strategy that has many different parameters? then it's going to be impossible to tell just by looking at the Sharpe ratios for each parameter set whether any individual parameter happens to be overfit. So what we do is we reduce the dimensionality of the problem by taking a cross section. So I have a cube here with a square intersecting it. The square is the cross section of the cube. And the cube has three dimensions. The square, of course, just has two. So you can see that the cross section of the cube, i.e. the square, is a reduction in the dimensionality. So when we're taking the cross-section performance metrics, it's very similar, it's analogous. We're reducing the dimensionality to something that we can work with, and at that point we can look for smoothness and stability of the cross-sectional metrics across different parameter values. And if they are smooth and stable, that's a good sign that the strategy is not overfit. If they're instead very jagged, as they were in the moving average crossover example, then that's evidence that the strategy could in fact be overfit. So how does this work mathematically? Suppose the strategy has two parameters, A and B. Of course, you can generalize this to any number of parameters, but just for simplicity, we'll just assume the strategy has two parameters. Let A take values in A1 to AN, B take values in B1 to BM, and let S of AI BJ be the Sharpe ratio corresponding to the parameter set A equals AI, B equals BJ. We can compute the cross-sectional Sharpe ratio of the parameter value AI for A using the formula S of AI equals 1 over M times the sum from J equals 1 to M of S of AI BJ. And you can compute the cross-sectional Sharpe ratio of the parameter value BJ for B using the same formula, except you're summing over values of A instead of values of B. But big picture here, the idea is to reduce the dimensionality of the space so that you can get it in the form of something you can work with. And you can check for the smoothness and stability of the cross-section metrics 
and that will give you an indication as to whether or not the strategy is overfit. And finally, out of sample testing using a rolling window. Now this may be the most important slide in the entire quant trading and futures video series. It's very important to understand the concepts of out of sample testing and rolling window. They'll appear later on in the parameter optimization and portfolio optimization videos. And this really is the most surefire way to avoid overfitting when you're doing a back test. So when you are doing a back test, there's two goals that are in conflict. On the one hand, you want to determine which parameter sets to use, you want to assign weights to them. So there's parameter optimization going on, portfolio optimization going on. But on the other hand, you don't want to overfit. So optimizing without overfitting, this is very difficult to do. And the solution is that for each year in the back test, you want to train on the prior 10 years in the sample period and test on the current year, the out of sample period. In the illustration I've provided, the blue boxes correspond to the training years, the in-sample period, and the green boxes correspond to the testing years, the out-of-sample period. The idea is we're going to do all of our training in these blue boxes. So all the optimization, parameter optimization, portfolio optimization, all of that is done in the training period and just blindly applied to the testing period. That's how you know how the strategy would have performed in that given year. So if you want to see how the strategy would have performed in 2007. We optimize using 1997 to 2006, just apply that to 2007. And in fact, when we're evaluating a trading strategy, we're computing the performance metrics over the out of sample period. So that's going to be the aggregation of all the testing years, the aggregation of all these green boxes. That's how we know how a strategy would have performed out of sample. Back testing only in sample, on the other hand, without an out of sample test, Without a rolling window fails because it introduces look-ahead bias. It's important to simulate trading decisions using only data that would have been available at the time. So you can't use data on the performance of parameter sets in future years, only on prior years. Backtesting solely in sample is tantamount to observing many possible futures and then selecting the best possible future. So it's very obvious that this is a bad practice it's not going to give you reliable results, and yet is the most common backtesting mistake. It's important to remember that the purpose of a backtest is to determine if a trading strategy would have been profitable if it were actually traded. So it's important that your, your backtest is as close to reality as possible, and that means only using information that you would have had available to you at the time of placing the trades. The reality is that most strategies are overfit and would have not have even worked in the past, but I do want to caution you that even if a strategy did work in the past, that's no guarantee that it will continue to work in the future. This could be because of a regime change. That means that the markets are fundamentally different today than they were in the past. So just because a strategy worked well in the past, it's not going to work today. It could be because of a publication. Once a strategy is out there, traders are going to catch on and take the edge away. And just general increasing market efficiency in that these anomalies tend to go away over time because there's a very strong monetary incentive to find profitable trading strategies, and once they're found, the edge goes away. So backtesting is a tool to reject a strategy, not to accept one. If a strategy struggled over the backtest, it will almost certainly struggle when you live trade it. But if a strategy did well over a backtest, it still may struggle when you live trade it. So you'll never know for sure if a strategy works just from the backtest alone. The only thing you can do is to find many different strategies that actually worked in the past, diversify among these strategies, and hopefully the majority of them will continue to work in the future. So that's it for this video on overfitting. Next time we're going to discuss parameter optimization using machine learning techniques.